My name is Lina Beydoun, Director of Development at the American University in Cairo, and I will be moderating the discussion today with five gender experts. The webinar today coincides with the anniversary of the declaration of COVID-19 as a global pandemic, a year during which women have been disproportionately impacted by violence, displacement, unemployment, and increase in poverty. The panelists will examine the distinct effects of conflict on women in the MENA region and the ways to ensure gender equality and peace. Each panelist will speak for about 10 minutes, followed by a 30 minutes of a discussion, question and answers with the audience. Please type any questions you may have for the panelists in either English or Arabic in the Q&A box that you will find at the bottom of your screens. Now I will um, turn this over uh, to uh, Dr. Eli Abu Abouaoun. He is the U.S. Institute of Peace um, MENA Programs Director. He will give some opening remarks before we start. I turn it over to you, Dr. Ili. Thank you very much, Dr. Baidun. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone, depending on where you are. And thank you all for joining us from all over the world for this important discussion. Uh, first, I'd like to thank the American University and the Emirates for uh, co-organizing and co-hosting with us, with the U.S. Institute of Peace, uh, this event. Uh, as EMINA Regional Office, we're really proud uh, of this first uh, collaboration with the AUE, and we hope that this uh, will, uh, will lead to many other uh, fruitful collaborations. Uh, I'd like also to thank uh, all of our distinguished panelists who have taken the time to be here with us today. Uh, and to share their insights and experiences on, on the topic. Uh, and special thanks to Nahla for uh, her vision and, uh, and dedication to, to putting this event together, as well as my colleague Molly Gallagher, who, who was also the lead person from our end. Uh, <clears throat> this event coincides with the week of uh, International Women's Day on March 8th. Uh, a day that we honor and reflect upon the strength, courage, and brilliance of women in our lives. Uh, it's also a day upon which we seek to elevate the plight of those women who are not yet safe from harm uh, or not free. Uh, we remember also that there are still a, a great many women, uh, sorry, there are still ma many great women and girls uh, uh, who are actually because of of, the, of their because of their uh, or because of them being women actually uh, they've been held captive, exploited, underestimated, and excluded. Uh, these harmful dynamics are worsened when conflict erupts, obviously, uh, and we we're seeing this all over the region in all uh, in all the conflicts that are gone, ongoing in the region. We we are seeing the heavy impact on women and girls more specifically. So the event today uh, seeks to explore how the international community, the practitioners, and policymakers can work together. Uh, for a better protection of vulnerable women, uh, especially in conflicts uh, across the MENA region. Uh, so I do hope that at the end of the event, we will learn, uh, you know, new, new, new ideas or new tactics uh, about uh, improving uh, protection uh, for women and girls. So I, look really, I really look forward to the discussion and the insights that everyone will share with us. And over to you, Lina. Thank you. Well, thank you so much again, Dr. Ili Abouaoun, um, representing U.S. Institute of Peace. Um, now I turn it over to Dr. Nahla Yassin Hamdan, who is uh, representing the uh, co-organizer of this event, the American University in the Emirates. The floor is yours, Nahla, and uh, just uh, briefly, um, uh, Nahla is the Assistant Professor in the College of Security and Global Studies at the American University in the Emirates, AUE. She is a certified mediator and international relations expert and the co-author of Arab Approaches to Conflict Resolution, Mediation, Negotiation, and Settlement of Political Disputes. 
The floor is yours, Nahla. Good afternoon for those who are in the our region. Good morning for my friends and everyone in the U.S., Canada. Thank you so much for the chance. And I apologize on behalf of the president of the university. It was suddenly an emergency happened, it seems, and he couldn't make it to the uh, to here. We'll uh, probably hear later from our uh, provost uh, or the dean, Dr. Maris. Thank you so much. And also, uh, I would like to start by saying, uh, starting this webinar is a very important and timely webinar, as Dr. Eli has just mentioned. And uh, what, uh, what was more important than coming now, the CSW, Commission the Status of Women in New York, coming uh, soon, uh, uh, so the um, uh, 15th of March, uh, till the 23rd probably, whatever it is yeah, within this field, that is very timely now we're going to talk about. And the theme, but, but the theme that I'm going to talk about, actually all of us, I'm going to start talking about, is the theme is this year about women in public life, equal participation in decision making, and violence achieve gender equality. So my presentation today will be about gender equality, and of course in specific I want to talk about gender inequality in the Arab world, which is the MENA region. And uh, also, uh, having said that, uh, the gender inequality uh, we're going to talk about, I'm going to use the, the, the UNDP uh, definition of that, meaning I'm going to be talking about the gender inequality index, which is grounded in a theory that posits that, uh, that posits that it will diminish with economic development, improvements in healthcare, education attainment, labor force participation, and political empowerment. So these are the uh, really facts that I measured actually statistically, but uh, there's no time to talk about all these things and I concentrate on the uh, importance of the uh, economic uh, empowerment and the labor force. So therefore, gender inequality is a global problem, actually, and it's a barrier to human development. Where the average of uh, human uh, development index for women is 6% lower than that of men, generally. Uh, so the, uh, the gender equality inequality in the Arab world, I will argue that females in some Arab countries have achieved parity, really, uh, with male education, that's true, especially in, the, in this region, and literacy. The rates of participation in the paid the paid labor force, unfortunately, are the lowest in the world. And I have the statistics, uh, recent statistics as of uh, 2021, January 29, saying that uh, 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 Syria 15% of the female labor force, uh, Iraq 12, Libya 34, Algeria 17, Yemen 6. Of course, uh, we will see how the you know, um, variation, of course, in Arab countries according to per capita income. UAE is 52, since we're here. Qatar, 57 is the highest, actually, Qatar, 57%. And that's, uh, you know, upon the statistics to understand the, the variations in the, in the Arab countries themselves, 22 Arab countries. So um, I will uh, concentrate also about, you know, how do I do to, uh, to concentrate about the model of gender inequality in the Arab world, where I found important, significant. Uh, in the measuring the uh, power person capacity for women, which is uh, reflecting the importance of economic empowerment and inclusion of women in the labor force, as we just mentioned. The most important uh, finding is that uh, uh, I found that the relationship of corruption index and gender inequality index, that's of course, uh, that uh, the higher level of corruption tends to have, of course, high uh, scores of uh, inequality. So corruption is a patriarchal practice. However, uh, not everything is, is you know, back uh, to the corruption, to the uh, role of patriarchy in the Arab world is to be uh, the main reason for the uh, this gender empowerment. Therefore, we are, they are now new studies has been shown that you know there are intersections of vectors of social inequality, and uh, that's why we're going to talk about also the new uh, form that the literature coming up about gender justice that was proposed actually back in 2017, if I remember correctly, in the Declaration of Muscat Declaration of Human Rights. They talk about gender justice. So this is a new form actually coming in the Arab world, which is you know, making the urgent need to consider this gender empowerment as an issue of human rights. And that's the link is very important. I have some statistics shared with you from my uh, research. So, uh, also, that I found a lot of, uh, of course, uh, the corruption index also was, of course, high in most um, the corruption in most uh, uh, countries of, uh, that are, uh, of course, uh, conflict-ridden. Where I found that uh, the uh, corruption index was for uh, high, the average for the Arab countries, which is 33.4, which is uh, meaning in statistics means that the lower the, the score, the higher the corruption. 
and it is it has was 33.4 half of that of the I measured and I compared with OECD countries uh, Organization of Economic uh, Cooperation and Development and they have average of 68 percent so more corrupt countries tend to have lower per capita incomes that's the conclusion and uh, of course uh, the uh, this will give us uh, for, uh, the information that what could be done, what are kind of uh, policies of the Arab world has to be to, to address this inequality and uh, less of the corruption. And uh, also um, the relationship will be uh, also showing uh, in the, uh, nowadays with the countries, especially like uh, Yemen, uh, Libya, where women are not, you know, in higher positions also, uh, even though there are, you know, struggles uh, in their societies. So um, also uh, that will give us a conclusion that representation is not enough. We have seen that also have women in parliaments and politi politics is not enough to drive the gender empowerment. We need probably to have more uh, global movement like the SSW stuff to share ideas. And the, uh, also uh, we need to, uh, the, then the driver of inequality may not be, uh, as I said, Patriarch, we have to look into these factors. I look to uh, corruption and the political empowerment through economic independence. So labor participation is very important, as I uh, know, and that will uh, and uh, more uh, more uh, problems arise also for gender empowerment in the after COVID-19, of course, where a woman has you know the most uh, uh, targeted group that have informal. Uh, uh, kind of work that uh, give them more exposure to COVID. We have the no resources for health resources and give them at a very high percentage of uh, of poverty action. COVID-19 women also, um, uh, they have also, there have been studies that have seen that these uh, uh, regions who have high in COVID-19 also, women are being subjected into the kind of uh, harassment and uh, eventually violence, gender-based violence. So I will, uh, I think I finished the, I still have three minutes. <laughs> I still have three minutes. So I would like to conclude my presentation by saying there is no question that gender equality is the key to economic growth. And we should invest more in women's collective rather than individual empowerment. Thank you. And you know, thank you so much for listening. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nahla. Um, before I move on to our second speaker, uh, Professor Valentine Mugaddam, um, she was offering also some uh, possible reasons why we have a higher uh, female labor force participation in places like Qatar um, and the UAE, the United Arab Emirates. Um, could you possibly elaborate a little bit on that before we move on? Um, yes, because sure. this, this is quite uh, interesting, although in general, I mean, the numbers are very dismal in, in the MENA region. Why is it that we have higher labor force uh, participation? In because, the yeah, because, yeah, because, uh, so thank you uh, for the question. Good, very good question. Because more corrupt countries have, uh, in my research and my analysis, that have found that more corrupt countries tend to have lower per capita incomes. And in my also, I found that seven very corrupt Arab countries have average index values less than 20, which is Syria, Yemen, Libya, Iraq, South Sudan, North Sudan, and Somalia. So this is, this is, uh, it's noted that women hold little, uh, little power positions there, I mean, political power. Only two Arab countries, as I said, in the index I've studied, has values less over, the, greater than 60, which are Qatar and the United Arab Emirates. Hence, it explains the, the Arab countries' variation in per capita incomes, very important. Hence, Arab governments can empower women in poor countries. I have in my paper, of course, a lot of things to talk about if I have time, about in agriculture, they can promote women of local produce, empower women in poor societies. The governments can do a lot to, to create some job opportunities for especially in rural areas, especially. So that's, you know, statistically significant, yes. So corruption is really linked to gender equality, high. And of course, you know that, that, that uh, uh, of course, corrupt, I mean, uh, gender uh, inequality and uh, lo means law dev development means it's conflict. So they are the, uh, the correlation between the three. Everybody knows that. So, and that's been proven to be correct. 
Thank you. Thank you again so much, Nahla. And I will give an opportunity for uh, Professor uh, Valentine and others on this panel to also weigh in on this particular issue because I think it's really relevant to the discussion. So now I uh, I, I will introduce uh, Professor Valentine Mogaddam. She is a professor of sociology and international affairs at Northeastern University in Boston. Among her many publications, Professor Mogaddam is author of Modernizing Women, uh, Gender and Social Change in the Middle East that has been published and published again uh, at, at least three times, and the award-winning Globalizing Women Transnational Feminist Networks. Please, I turn it over to you. Bye. Thank you very much, um, uh, Dr. Beydoun. Um, it's uh, really a pleasure to be part of this very important discussion and to be among such illustrious uh, speakers as well. Um, Dr. Uh, Yassin um, Hamdan just uh, emphasized gender gaps in um, education and labor force participation as barriers uh, to human development and um, women's political empowerment alike. As a complement to her analysis, I want to emphasize militarism, specifically very high rates of military spending by Middle East, North Africa, MENA countries, and the massive arms flows to the region emanating largely from Western states as barriers to gender equality, as well as to peace, reconciliation, and uh, security in the region. May I just remind you that in the past two decades alone, the region has experienced conflict, war, or failed states in Iraq, Bahrain, Libya, Syria, Yemen, and there's also the overlong Palestinian-Israeli um, contention. The Syrian refugee crisis and Yemen's humanitarian catastrophe are but two of the outcomes, both of which have had disastrous effects on households, women, and girls. Security Council Resolution 1325 National action plans have been crafted, but only in a few countries, and even those are but ink on paper, according to a recent report. So let me begin with a summary uh, review of the feminist literature on international relations, the feminist IR literature. I will then briefly go over patterns of military spending in MENA countries, drawing on data from the Stockholm International uh, Peace Research Institute, also the World Bank and UNDP. And then I will offer some concluding thoughts. I should say that my presentation today is based on a paper that will be published um, next year. Okay, key points in uh, feminist IR literature. Um, since at least the pioneering work of Cynthia Enloe, feminist scholars have examined the close link between militarism and patriarchy. As Enloe argued, militarization affects women's lives in both the private sphere of the household and the public sphere of states, markets, and institutions. Research also links militarization with what R.W. Connell uh, theorized as forms of hegemonic masculinity and emphasized femininity, um, which tend to perpetuate women's subordination and vulnerability to violence through what, for example, Cynthia, uh, through what other scholars have called militarized masculinity and manly states. So the clear connection between um, very high military spendings, a, a, a very large role for the military, and of course the perpetuation of patriarchy at different levels macro, meso, and micro. So militarism and gender inequality are thus mutually reinforcing. First, military spending crowds out social spending, such as on education and health, including financing for the advancement and welfare of women and girls. And that would include, for example, migrant labor and um, poor girls, um, you know, women from poor households, et cetera. Conflicts, wars, and, any, uh, and refugee status have a disproportionate impact on women due to persistent gender inequality in access to economic and political resources, which we just heard about from Dr. Yassin. According to the Women's Stats Project, patriarchy and gender inequality are themselves causal factors in civil conflict and interstate uh, conflict. So this is what I mean by this mutually reinforcing relationship. And then the result of this 
is what Cynthia Coburn has called the continuum of violence, from domestic violence to sexualized violence in conflicts and wars. So for scholar Anne Tickner, therefore, security equals the absence of violence, whether military, economic, or sexual. In a word, the feminist IR literature has emphasized the gendered nature of social relations, institutions, power, and world politics itself, including regional politics. So quickly on military spending in MENA. It's always been very, very high. SIPRI, that Stockholm Institute for Peace Research, um, uh, uh, it, Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, provides data and analysis on military spending, arms production, export, and import. And it shows that since 1991, average regional military spending has been higher in the MENA region than other developing regions. Between 1988 and 2003, the largest proportions of gross domestic product uh, allocated to the military were found in Israel, Jordan, Syria, Yemen, and the GCC countries. Exceptionally high levels of military spending are found in Saudi Arabia and Oman, and I have a uh, graph that shows that in 2015, for example, in Saudi Arabia, 13% of GDP was spent on um, military and arms um, procurements. Um, but there also are high levels in Kuwait, Bahrain, and Algeria. Um, the UAE does not uh, provide um, you know, adequate and timely uh, data on, um, on its military spending. But in 2010, according to the World Bank and the UNDP, military spending consumed fully 6% of GDP two or three times more than what the UAE spent on health or education. Now, those are the rich countries. Let's look at the poorest country in the region, Yemen. The figures for Yemen's military spending over the same period were quite problematical. The figures exemplify what I mentioned earlier about that trade-off between militarism on the one hand and social spending and women's advancement on the other. Under President Saleh, Yemen had become an ally of the U.S. war on terror, and thus its military spending as a percentage of GDP was almost 7% in 2002 and 2003. It fell to 5% in 2004, still very high, but remaining steady at around 4%, still very high, um, in 2013-2014. But Yemen's spending on health care consumed just one3 percent of GDP in 2010, compared to um, you know, five, four and five percent on the military. At the same time, Yemen's maternal mortality rate per 100,000 uh, live births was 210, twice as much as the next country in the region, Morocco, uh, which had a, a maternal mortality rate of 110 um, per 100,000 uh, 100, live births. Just 36% of births in Yemen were attended by skilled health personnel. Yemen's mean years of schooling were just 2.5 years. And of course, we know that heavy veiling um, and child marriage were uh, widespread in, uh, in Yemen. So who supplies all the weapons to the region? In short, it's the US and the UK and France. U.S. weapons sales to Saudi Arabia have included cluster bombs and other munitions that have been used to hit densely populated areas, schools, and even a camp for displaced people in Yemen. So those countries that have very high military spending and getting a lot of arms from the U.S., Britain, and France, Saudi Arabia, and UAE, the richest countries in the region, are also attacking the poorest country uh, in the region. So militarism affects gender equality or inequality in other ways as well, not just the trade-off between um, military spending and social spending. U.S. military bases are found across the globe, but also in the Middle East. Um, 
And then uh, a very interesting paper by the Princeton scholar um, Amani Jamal shows that US military deployment in the Middle East is negatively associated with the status of women because the regimes that host US military personnel and bases feel compelled to mollify their conservative constituencies in what Jamal uh, terms the woman's bargain. Among Arab countries, Tunisia stands out for its low military spending and higher status of women, certainly in that whole period uh, before the Arab Spring countries. In fact, in my own study of uh, the gender outcomes of the Arab Spring, in a paper that was published in um, 2018, I think, I found that only Tunisia, with its low military spending and vocal and visible feminist organizations and much better gender um, indicators in 2010, 2011 than any of the other countries, had the most favorable outcomes for women. It's no surprise. So the COVID-19 crisis has exposed critical underinvestment in health and social protections in uh, many countries. And I'm very happy to hear that um, ESQA, under Mernaz's uh, CAPA leader, uh, uh, leadership um, in that uh, sector, will be uh, focusing on this issue. In MENA countries, the billions of dollars spent on arms purchases could be invested in the strengthening of local, regional, and global mechanisms for the realization of economic and social rights and for promoting peace and people's resilience to crises and, and the pandemics. In the midst of the pandemic, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres appealed for a global ceasefire. That has yet to transpire. In the summer of 2020, ESQA called for a regional solidarity fund to support the poorest and most vulnerable groups and countries, an excellent um, appeal. But to my knowledge, no moves have been made uh, in that direction to date. So the conflicts continue, as do gender inequalities, as seen in the gender gap report of 2020. And very quickly, I'll just point out as a compliment to what Dr. Nahla was also saying, that in terms of economic participation and opportunity, the MENA countries are clustered at the very bottom. Um, 132 out of uh, 153 uh, countries on the list. Educational attainment, as she pointed out, is better. It starts at 81 with Jordan, but Yemen and Iraq are at the very bottom. These are conflict countries, obviously. Um, in terms of political empowerment, Tunisia. Tunisia is ranked 67 on that list, higher than Korea at 79, higher than America <laughs> at uh, 86, and higher than Greece at 87. And um, the narratives and another one of the figures on in that gender gap report of 2000, uh, 2020, sorry, shows that Nina still has the widest gender gap of any region, 61% gender gap. So to conclude, many arguments have been put forward to explain the wide gender gaps in the region, including the strength of social norms and the regional oil economy. My presentation has posited that the region's high military spending and the massive flow of arms into the region reinforce patriarchal institutions and norms, male domination, and the persistently wide gender gaps, and the violence and conflicts that harm women and girls. In turn, the absence of women from the levers of political power enables misguided decision-making and policies, such as the recourse to militaristic state behavior in a type of vicious cycle. The challenge for us is to propose ways of turning that vicious cycle into a virtuous one. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Professor Val, uh, for your insights into this. Uh, I will move to the third speaker, but before I do, there is a question posed from the audience that I think um, I, I, I need to address right now regarding your uh, concept of militarized uh, masculinities. Um, it suggests that this perhaps is a little bit deterministic to link military spending to gender inequality. There may be other uh, factors that play a role or contribute to gender inequality, including social norms and cultures around uh, women and gender um, in many of the Arab countries, uh, particularly. So also um, a, another question is, how is it that um, Israel, which is the fifth uh, globally in terms of military spending, fares better in terms of gender equality? Um, according to, thank you for that um, uh, question. According to uh, Israeli uh, scholars, feminist scholars, um, uh, women's status, women's legal status is still is problematical, especially in terms of uh, the country's religious-based family law. Um, and, um, uh, and in other aspects as well, the kinds of uh, professions and occupations that women um, enter into is still um, subject to a kind of sex segregation as it were, um, occupational sex segregation. So Israel um, uh, has very high military spending. And I think that if you compare Israel to some other countries with lower um, military spending, for example, Tunisia, um, the, uh, the status of, uh, you know, of women would be uh, uh, very different. On the other hand, remember also that militarism, I'm not arguing that militarism and high military spending is the only factor behind um, uh, gender inequality. I myself have worked on social norms. I myself have worked on economic factors. Um, but um, but I, 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 I wanted to highlight that because, for example, let's take the United States. The United States has the biggest military in the world um, and the highest military expenditure of any country um, and, the, and higher than the next set of countries that also have high military spending. And if you compare uh, gender uh, equality or inequality between the US and some of the other, for example, OECD countries, the United States doesn't score well whatsoever. I, I already gave you the uh, example of the political empowerment score, where even you know Tunisia is much higher on political empowerment than the United States. We know that the United States has consistently ranked lower in terms of women's political empowerment and you know, not to mention the wage gap and so on. So I think that there is really something to be said for this connection between militarism and, um, and uh, patriarchy. Um, and I'm happy to discuss this further later. Thank you. Thank you so much for that clarification, uh, Professor Val, and we will certainly get more questions uh, during the Q&A um, session. I will now uh, move to our third speaker, uh, Marina Zayawadi. She is the director of uh, the Gender Justice Population and Inclusive Development Cluster at the UN Economic and Social Commission for Western Asia, uh, ESQA. Her current research areas include gender main mainstream combating violence against women and gender justice in the Arab world. The floor is yours, Marinas. Thank you, Lina, so much, and thank you for everyone. Um, in my intervention, I'm going to focus on some enabling factors that would allow for increased uh, women participation in conflict prevention and in post-conflict uh, and recovery. The first thing is the socioeconomic situation of the entire society. So we cannot really uh, disassociate the situation of women from the entire situation of men and the entire uh, economic uh, uh, in the society. And some examples are before COVID, for example, women used to earn about 79% less than men in the Arab region, and about 39 of women were not active in the labor market in the Arab region, and 66 of working women in the region were in the informal sector, with no social protection schemes whatsoever. Then COVID came to hit the world with serious socioeconomic implications, and 
Our estimates at ESQA shows that the world had paid about $19 trillion for stimulus and fiscal packages, and the global growth deteriorated by about 6% with a tremendous increase in poverty and in unemployment. If we look at the Arab region, we estimated at ESQA a loss of $180 billion only in 2020 in the GDP due to COVID. We also estimated additional 18 million people to fall into poverty in addition to those who were there before COVID. And of course, as Michael said, even if the country is not in conflict, Okay, so that's the first point I want, to, uh, I want to say that the situation of women is really associated and go hand in hand with the situation of the country in general. The second point or the second factor is that the engagement of women in times of conflict is an extension of their engagement before conflict and in public life in general. So if women had been actively engaged in public life in times of peace, there is a great possibility that this is extended in case of a natural disaster or economic disaster or in the case of uh, COVID. And here we're not talking only about representation, as uh, Dr. Nahla was saying, but I'm talking about actual participation and not only representation. I'll give two examples, two country studies from Tunisia and from Lebanon on how the women peace and security agenda was shaped and the NAP was shaped because I know uh, our colleague the, uh, Dr. Suzanne is going to talk about Iraq, so I'm not going to mention that. The significant participation of Tunisian women in the uprising and the transition to democracy mirrors a long legacy of women's human rights gains since the country's independence in 1957, as uh, Dr. Muqaddam was saying. So Tunisia is known for that. Women in, Tunisia, in the Tunisian parliament make up about 24.7% and ranked 75 in the latest 2019 election. And now make up 47% of the local council positions in Tunisia following the May uh, 2018 election, which is the highest in the Arab region. After the political developments of uh, 2010, Tunisian women were included at all level of the transitional justice. So what I'm trying to say, they were active before uh, any conflict happened, and this activism had continued after the conflict. So during the conflict, women played an active role in drafting the new constitution, uh, Tunis. There were also quota for women's participation and representation in the technical committees and national consulta consultations of the Truth and Dignity uh, Commission. The meaningful engagement of women's civil society organizations in the commission provided support to women by conducting outreach and making the overall process more accessible and sensitive to their needs. The increased participation of women helped give voice to the experiences of other women. Tunisian women are also playing a unique role in addressing violent extremism, which is reflected in the National Action Plan uh, for 1325. What was very helpful also in the case of Tunisia is that the National Women, Peace and Security Plan, which was issued in 2018, laid the ground for this. The NAP was done first in a very uh, participatory manner. It is a very good practice what uh, Tunis had done. They have identified a range of national priorities for actions under the prevention, protection, participation, relief and recovery and, act and advocacy pillars of the NAP. The priorities were based on the ongoing sectoral plans and strategies. But we believe that despite these challenges that the NAP might have, which is from our point of view, the first thing is the NAP does not really have a very solid monitoring and evaluation framework attached to it, which is a problem and make it sometimes uh, ink on paper, as Dr. Mukaddam was saying. Uh, the second is that there is no costing that was done for the NAP. So we don't know exactly how much it is going to cost if we want to implement the entire NAP. However, 
due to the long history of participation of Tunisian women, there is high expectation that they will be able to implement uh, the NAP in a good manner. Lebanon is another completely different story due to many things which most of you might know due to the politics in Lebanon and everything. But historically speaking, women in Lebanon had been absent from the formal conflict resolution and recovery processes. The 2008-2012 National Dialogue, which resulted in the Abda Declaration, was mainly attended by political leaders and with almost complete absence for women. Women representation in the cabinet and parliament had always been among the lowest in the Arab region and sometimes with only one woman. It's very recent when Lebanon started appointing more women in the cabinet and in the, in the cabinet and in the parliament and had the first Arab uh, minister in the Arab region as a minister for interior and a minister for defense. However, there is a great possibility that this change is not for the purpose of achieving gender equality. It could be for many other things, like quotas, for example, among political parties and other reasons. Looking at the blast that hit Beirut in August 2020 is another example of how women had been systematically excluded uh, from sincere and formal participation. So, for example, the, women's, the women involvement in the response was mainly through civil society and mainly through UN agencies who work together to identify the needs of women during uh, these difficult times. I will now come to the NAP, which was endorsed in 2019. Preparing the NAP in Lebanon, we view it in ESQA as the best NAP that was done. I'm talking here about the papers, I'm not talking about implementation, but I'm talking about the process and the end result. They had an excellent participatory process, which is very difficult in the case of Lebanon to reach consensus about something like that, and it was endorsed by the Prime Minister. Um, it had participation, it had consultation first to, to be done with all stakeholders in Lebanon, including academia, political parties, government, civil societies, and it was done with the support of ESQA, UN Women, UNDP, UNFPA, almost all UN agencies in Lebanon. Um, it also included a particular emphasis for the protection of Syrian refugees, which is a great thing. Uh, it includes a direct reference to women's participation and leadership in effective early warning systems to prevent conflict and violence and extremism. One of the strengths of the Lebanon NAP, which we are trying to advocate for in other countries, is that it has a very strong monitoring and evaluation uh, framework, and it has we have coasted how much the NAP is going to be uh, to take to implement it completely. So the four-year plan, which starts from 2019 until 2022, was estimated to take about $15 million. And this budget was shared with all donors in Lebanon in a several uh, meetings. So it was very clear to them, if you want the NAP to be done, if you want this specific activity, this is how much it's going to, uh, to cost. And then that's how donors started to get engaged and started to fund specific activities to make sure that it is complemented. And the NAP was done in a way that everything else would go under that. So it's the chapeau or the umbrella. So a violence against women strategy, which we have also developed with the government, goes under the NAP. So it became, as I'm saying, like a national uh, agenda that everything is going under that to make it uh, happen and being implemented. We're hoping that despite the very minimal representation of women in Lebanon across time, that the strong and solid plan will help uh, in implementing it. And to sum up, these are only two factors which I've identified here, but there are many. Okay? But these are like uh, things that I wanted to share with you is the overall uh, uh, status of the society in general and the situation of women prior to any conflict. However, there are others that I'm going to just say uh, very quickly and tap on them. One of them is it's very important to, uh, to invest in evidence-based research to have a real participation for women in uh, conflict and after that. Uh, so, for example, this kind of research would tell us that when women participate in peace processes, the resulting agreement is more durable and better implemented 
The presence of female signatories among conflict parties positively, positively impact the quality and the durability of peace. Second, countries also need to work sincerely on reforming the discriminatory legal framework. And these are mainly, I would say, in the family, marriage, nationality rights, but others like the equal pay, like many things, and not only the reform in laws, but also in implementing them. Uh, and of course, everybody knows about the necessity to change the conservative social norms that are hindering that. Another factor that is very important is developing a national action plan for women, peace and security. As of December 2020, 89 countries across the world have developed women, peace and securities uh, plan. And only seven of them, of these 89, are in the Arab region, which are Iraq, Palestine, Jordan, Tunisia, Lebanon, Yemen and Sudan while others are making their plans currently, including Algeria, Egypt, Kuwait, Morocco, Syria, and UAE. From our experience, to have these plans implemented and not being ink on paper, they have to be associated with a solid monitoring and evaluation framework, a costing that is very detailed, and it has to be in a participatory manner and fully endorsed by the government and by civil society, because they do play a very important role in the implementation. And I'll stop here and we'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Marinez. Um, before I move to the fourth speaker, um, there is always this um, country that comes up in every discussion on gender in the MENA region, and that's Tunisia. Is Tunisia the exceptionalist you know, country? Is it playing that role of exceptionalism here? What is it about Tunisia that makes it stand out from the rest um, of the uh, countries in the MENA region? And that uh, relates to a question from the audience about how come Tunisia as a struggling democracy has managed to um, uh, you know, be able to be better uh, and fare better in terms of women's empowerment? And this is a question for both Professor Val and Dr. Mary Naz, since you work, you both work in Tunisia. Uh, you want me to start? Yes, please. Okay. I wouldn't say Tunisia is the exception, but it is faring well compared to others. But if we're talking about each country, I would say in the Arab region has a good example and a good practice in something. Like we have never thought before that the Gulf countries, for example, are going to be doing a national action plan for women, peace and security. Now they're all doing. If you're talking about violence against women, most of the countries now in the Arab countries are having uh, uh, violence against women national strategies and programs for that. However, I would say that Tunisia usually take a leading role. They usually start and then other northern countries, North African countries would follow and then others would go. And plus Tunisia, as I was saying, they have a long history in uh, women uh, empowerment. I wouldn't say that uh, they're, because they're struggling with democracy, they're having problems because we see now the US, for example, is also struggling with democracy. Okay, so there is a pros and cons for everything for that. And I'll leave it to uh, Dr. Valentine to comment on that as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I will just build on what Dr. Mehnaz has just said about the fact that, you know, democracy has to deliver. It has to deliver social rights and economic benefits to its citizens. Otherwise, it's imperiled. That is the problem in uh, Tunisia. Tunisia came out of the Arab Spring um, as the one um, success story in terms of a democratic transition. Um, however, as you know, I explain in um, a forthcoming book with my uh, friend and colleague, um, Dr. Um, uh, Shamiran Mako, um, that um, unlike third wave democratic transitions, um, Southern Europe, Latin America, South Korea, uh, Philippines, et cetera, this fourth wave democratic transition and especially the democratic transition in Tunisia uh, after the Arab Spring took place in the middle of the Great Recession, 
which um, actually harmed um, Tunisia um, tremendously and other countries too. And then the global pandemic, which also has had uh, very serious economic and, and uh, financial uh, impacts. So its democracy is uh, in peril precisely because it lacks those important investments from within and also from outside, which would generate jobs for its many, many unemployed um, young people in particular. But as uh, Dr. Um, Mernaz also pointed out, um, Tunisia has many decades of um, strong, a strong civil society, and in particular within that civil society, a very strong feminist movement. And, they, and those feminist organizations, the older ones and the new ones, were able to say, do not touch my achieved rights. Um, and, uh, and, and they have now uh, accomplished uh, some um, other quite um, impressive uh, legislative um, initiatives. Thank you so much to both of you uh, for um, elaborating more on Tunisia as a case study. Um, certainly an interesting one. We may have more questions from the audience regarding that and maybe some more regarding Lebanon uh, later on. Now I move on to the fourth speaker. Uh, it's Dr. Kathleen Kinast. She is the Director of Gender Policy and Strategy at the U.S. Institute of Peace. She has focused on the U.S. Security Council Resolution 1325 and has been part of the international vanguard of introducing the concept of engaging men in conflict countries in the championing of women's rights. Uh, so more about collaboration and coordination between men and women, uh, taking a positive spin on how they can work together uh, for uh, gender equality and peace. The floor is yours, Kathleen. Thank you so much. It is really a pleasure and an honor to join you today. And thank you for the opportunity to say a few words about gender policy and addressing the global challenges facing us today. I hope to share a practical approach of gender analysis that we have implemented at the U.S. Institute of Peace to broaden our set of understandings about gender and peace building. It's an effort to bring the best of the academic research to the field of practice in peace building. My work as an academic anthropologist and as a peace builder converged over a decade ago at USIP in Washington, where I work on the impact of violent conflict and violent extremism on the lives of men and women, boys and girls. I'm often asked what exactly is a director of gender policy and strategy. And as I tell my children, what I do every day is to help make the invisible visible. That means bringing the world of women who are mostly invisible into the halls of policy and into the field of practice and to, sure, and to ensure that women are counted as key decision makers and peace builders. In fact, the very role that they actually play each and every day in their societies. Indeed, webinars like this are key to bringing visibility to the many gaps in our understanding of gender and women and men. It is difficult to change the narrative about gender because gender is invisible, yet an intense organizing force in all our lives. We accept it usually without question. Gender roles are like the air we breathe. And sometimes we use the term gender as another name for women. But it is important to embrace the social science definition of the word gender, which is the expression of how a society organizes its expectations, norms, and values of men and women and sexual and gender minorities through its social and economic institutions, its laws, its schools, religious institutions, and familial processes. We know that violent conflict and the condition of violent states push gender relations often to extremes. We see it in men who have notions of hyper-masculinity and lead to extreme violence, including sexual violence, both 
in the home and on the front step of war. These stresses in society do disrupt gender norms, but we also believe that this disruption can and should open opportunities for restructuring gender relations for gender equality. And so when we say that gender is not only a name for women, we know that to actually change the gender equation, we need to also include men in the storyboard of this change. And so we challenge the very narrowly de defined notions of gender roles for men. Are men only protectors and providers? Or can a society support that men can also embrace uh, more expansive roles as caregivers and the notion of peaceful masculinity? And so these powerful dynamics that exist within our societies between men and women uh, are something that, of course, the recent research by Promundo UN Women through their images survey have helped us pay more attention to what it is in violent conflict and its aftermath that we can help better focus our gender equality efforts. We see that often men's coping strategies uh, seek to avoid and reduce feelings of vulnerability, often uh, resulting in frequently use of increased alcohol, substances abuse, and a resort to uh, domestic violence. Of course, we see this right now where we are looking at what are two pandemics, the pandemic of COVID-19 and also the unbelievable increase in gender-based violence. We found this uh, early on that in bringing a gender analysis that is inclusive of men, we saw it in Ukraine. We went to Ukraine in looking at how conflict was affecting women. Uh, but in fact, what we were surprised by was that actually the women were working quite well in collaboration, in cooperation. Uh, they had connections through their children's schools, through other civil society. But it was the men, uh, especially that middle age group who were not on the front fighting, that were feeling terrifically isolated, depressed as a result of emasculated feelings, and a sense of um, vulnerability and suicidal thoughts. It is at this point we realized that one of the best things we could do to help women was to begin to address some of these issues uh, found in uh, uh, the men in their society. We, um, we think that one of the problems with women, peace and security agenda, agenda is that it lacks a full spectrum gender analysis and thus it sometimes limits our understanding about the immediate and long-term consequences of international actions that may also result in for victimizing those groups who might be potential allies. So we have really worked to go beyond policies of just adding women through quotas or other gender balancing means, which we fully support, we suggest that they are incomplete in terms of our efforts towards gender mainstreaming and peace building. We think that having gender mainstreaming include an analysis of the roles of men and the opportunities in which we might engage them at this uh, locus of uh, intensity, especially in violent conflict, that this may force uh, further social change. In our own two-year study, USIP conducted on lessons learned on women's programming, both implemented in Iraq with my good colleague Susan Araf and also in Afghanistan, one of the most recommended and consistent comments for ensuring sustainable programs for women during war is to consider the role of men as gatekeepers, especially in highly sex segregated societies. So how do we engage men in the pursuit of gender equality? 
and so also to make sure they're not kept in a separate silo. So one of the ways we have done it uh, in addressing a cultural culture of violence at USIP is a peaceful masculinity project with men that we uh, piloted in Afghanistan. What we saw was for societies in which violence had gone on for decades, we understood that adult manhood became fused with violent rites of passage. We sometimes uh, refer to a UN special rep, uh, Zainab Bangura, who once said, it's not enough to take the guns out of the hands of young men at the end of a war, but we have to take those guns out of their minds. So I want to just share very briefly with you a very quick to use tool that USIP has created for our own staff and for anyone who wants to use it, it's on our website. It's called the Gender Inclusive Framework and Theory. Otherwise, the acronym is known as the GIFT. It is also now available in Arabic. This approach examines how violence affects the norms of masculinity and the consequent normalization of violence by men and boys for solving problems in their society. Masculinity is the behaviors, attitudes, and values that societies expect of men and boys. And most of the combatants in wars are men, and they perpetuate and perpetrate most of the violence in times of peace. However, at the basis of this peaceful masculinities approach is the assertion that men are not inherently violent. And this approach acknowledges that violence and violent conflict have long-term impacts on men and boys and therefore also need to be addressed. The Peaceful Masculinities approach shifts the narrative from the idea of men as inevitable perpetrators of violence to understanding that masculinities are socially constructed and can be shaped around peace. I would add, we say that masculinities aren't reserved for men because certainly we as women have inculcated masculinities into everything we do because we live in a very masculine world. So it's important to uh, not only associate men and masculinity, but as women understand that part of our own world. So programs like the Young Men's Initiative in the Balkans, who aim to shape, reshape social norms by working with young men through schools, summer youth camps, vocational training, uh, to promote nonviolent conceptions of manhood, including the respect for individuals of diverse sexual orientation and gender identity. Peaceful masculinity questions men's acceptance of violence as a part of their masculinity and seeks to disassociate violence from understandings of manhood or masculinity. This approach does not seek to shame men or boys, but to illuminate alternative peaceful ideas of what it means to be a man and what that might mean to sustaining a more peaceful society and more importantly, key to peaceful society is gender equality. I will stop there as I think my minutes are up, but I look forward to entertaining any questions about this very practical approach uh, to gender analysis, incorporating women, peace and security and peaceful masculinities. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Dr. Kathleen. Um, this is really, really interesting. And it, it made me think, how can we reconcile the concept that Professor Val introduced uh, in this panel regarding militarized masculinities with the concept you're working on, which is more of peaceful masculinities? Would you mind just sharing your thoughts on that? Yes, oh, I was listening with great uh, uh, admiration for uh, Professor Val. Uh, I think it's really a whole of society shift. And I think we're actually talking about the same thing. Uh, uh, Peaceful Masculinities uh, asserts that, you know, we need to begin talking about, uh, especially 
among youth uh, into adulthood, that rite of passage, are there alternatives to obtaining a sense of manhood without the use of violence, without the use of arms as a way of defining security? Uh, how, and it, you know, it goes much deeper into the literature about security and our understandings of that, but I'll, I'll stop there. Thanks again, Dr. Kathleen. And now uh, to our final speaker, uh, uh, Ms. Suzanne Arif. She is a human rights activist and founder and director of Women Empowerment Organization in Iraq. Since 2012, she has been playing a leading role in developing and implementing the Iraqi National Action Plan for UNSCR 1325, which was adopted by both governments in Iraq and Kurdistan in 2014. The floor is yours, Suzanne. Could you unmute yourself, please? Just a minute. Thank you, Lina. Good morning and good afternoon to everyone. It is indeed a privilege to join you today to speak about the gender dynamics in conflict affected MENA countries. But first, please allow me as we are celebrating the International Women's Day, I would like to wish a very happy Women's Day to the strong, intelligent and talented women in the world. Uh, going back to our topic like uh, the gender dynamics in conflict affected uh, countries and as you know all that Iraq is for many years armed conflicts including wars and terrorist groups have caused tragic levels of death, destruction and disorder in Iraq. In all conflict the adverse effect fall disproportionately on women and girls. Conflict increases that privilege of gender-based and sexual violence, and it is restrict the mobility of women and girls to access essential services and jobs. Violent extremism ideologies often target women's rights and their physical integrity. Gender-based violence is included in the strategic and ideology of terrorist groups using is as a tool for destroying societies and promoting recruitment and financing. This can be explicitly seen in the wars waged by Daesh and how the terrorist groups formed their campaigns against the civilian Daesh committed mass killing of Yazidi men and boys and created slavery markets for women and girls who were sold and bought and then were imposed with sexual slavery. Moreover, the escalation of the COVID-19 crisis globally has been mirrored in Iraq, affecting all aspects of life in the country including the ability of humanitarian actors to respond to the needs of vulnerable people. The pandemic has created also condition and factors exposed women and children to more violence. In addition to that, the pandemic was accompanied by an economic crisis and recession resulting from the significant decline in oil prices, which constitute most of Iraqi's imports and con coincided with a protest movement and political unrest, waking the government's ability to efficiently respond to the pandemic. According to the GBV assessment, which was produced by the EU Trust Fund MEDET and the Women Empowerment Organization, the percentage of women exposed to violence increased as a result of the spread of the epi epidemic and the measures taken 
to content it from 35 before the pandemic to nearly 60% the displaced women and refugees were more exposed to violence compared to women from the host community. And women outside the camps were more exposed to violence. Of course, this is, we mean the women IDPs, refugees outside the camps. Both before and during the pandemic, like 64% of women outside the camps reported their exposure compared to 56% of women inside the camp. So 64, it is for the outside camp and like six, uh, 56 for women inside the camps. It's shown by the assessment that most of the violence cases are cases of domestic violence committed by the husband or one of the family members. The result of the survey indicate that 47 of the violence comes from the husband, followed by the brothers, 13%, especially violence committed against a single woman. Then father, 12%, some of the displaced women in, the, in and outside the camps have complaint of harassment, stigmatization, and discrimination that comes from the host community's residents, reflecting their refusal to the presence of the displaced in their areas and that they have become a source of threat to the host communities. Although Iraq was the first MENA country that adopted the National Action Plan to implement, to implement the UN Security Council Resolution 1325 in 2014, but gender-based violence, discrimination in law, and inequality are still exist. As a civil society organization, we are committed to work supporting women peace and security agenda in Iraq and the second national action plan, we are aiming at empowering women and girls from host community IDPs and refugee by strengthening their participation in peace building, decision making and leadership through developing their capacities and skill in the public sector in, and camps. Since the establishment of the Women Empowerment Organization, we work to render its services as a part for, for four main sectors, economic empowerment, livelihood, political participation, legal and social advocacy, gaining support and lobbying. The organization played an important role in prioritizing and advocating for women peace security and leading initiatives to develop the National Action Plan for UN Security Council Resolution 1325 through building partnership with different entities, international agencies and organization NGOs and public sector. And we have to say like, it was the initiative of the women organization that Iraq became the first country in MENA region having the first National Action Plan. Certainly, we are working on the registration of the Alliance of 1325 under the name of Women Peace Security Agenda to become an official entity that is responsible for monitoring and supporting the implementation of 1325, as well as we are building the capacity of the public sector in the Kurdistan regional government on better implement and monitor the implementation of the second national action plan in partnership with USIP. <clears throat> in addition to that, we are targeting the IDPs and refugees, women in camps and vulnerable women of host communities through improved access to resources, cover basic needs, providing referral services in the context of the COVID-19. But I have also to highlight some challenges that we are facing through our work and for to achieve the Women Peace Security Agenda. 
the most important challenges that we are facing is the lack of budget and the lack of political will. I, I think it's connected. Since there is a lack of political will, it means there is lack of budget allocation. So this is how the, um, it, it is the uh, one of the most like important challenges that we are facing. And also lack of women machinery and clear mechanism that responsible on women issue within the executive authority. The existence of discriminatory laws that affect the achievement of gender equality. Example, the failure to pass the law of combating domestic violence law. And this is also, it is indicator the political participation of women is still ineffective and the quota mechanism is utilized in favor of the political parties. Because if we have a meaningful participation of women, we have 25 percentage of women participation in the parliament, but they are, most of them, they are against the domestic violence law. So this is it mean that the quota has been utilized in favor of political parties, not for women. The lack of effective judiciary prosecution for the perpetrators of sexual abuse, especially the survivor of the conflict from Daesh. Insufficiency of human rights mechanism to subject the members of state to to account due to the lack of commitments related to the agenda of women peace security. The impact of COVID-19 on the work of civil society organizations, especially service provision and advocacy activities. Decrease in women's number in the labor market. According to the World Bank report, it's only 15 percentage of women are involved in the labor market. To also give some recommendation on this, uh, so we believe that women peace security and the national action plan should be seen as a central to the recovery and rebuilding of Iraq. With a localized and inclusive approach to ensure the ownership. Women leadership and their meaningful participation is essential to reflect women perspective in all spect and authorities level. I think this is related to all like women participation, women leadership, if we can guarantee uh, women leadership in all the aspects so we can see the gender mainstreaming and institutionalize of women peace security agenda on all the levels. So the, the main problem, it is that still we don't have the meaningful participation of women. Consulting women rights organization in all phases of responding to the pandemic and into the crisis. Developing and implementing economic policies to support those affected by the pandemic and protect workers in the non-governmental sector from poverty, giving the priority to the women who are supporting their families. Developing a mechanism to allow victims to report violence in emergency and crisis situation. Launching awareness and education campaigns targeting the grassroots and community leaders aiming to discourage individuals from engaging a harmful, a harmful practices against women and lead to an actual change in traditional behaviors that discriminate against women. Establishing national plan to develop mental health services provided that these services are integrated into primary health care centers to ensure women's access to them. Secure the presence of women, uh, the presence of women organization networks and women activists at the local, regional and international levels and highlight the role of women peacemakers. Thank you and uh, I'm happy to respond to any question.
Thank you so much, Suzanne. And um, uh, we only have 10 minutes left. So what I want to do is pose a question from a member of the audience to you, and you can take that question and use it as part of the closing remarks uh, that I will invite each panelist to uh, essentially um, make. Um, the question to you, Suzanne, is Iraqi women's status is not isolated from the rest of the Iraqi society. How does your organization work on improving the circumstances of the society as a whole, including women? Um, and I also want to um, ask you if you can possibly uh, weigh in on how the pandemic is possibly contributing to um, essentially um, lack of gains in women and gender equality in the MENA regions as you make your closing remarks. And I'm going to start in the order that we started the presentation with uh, Dr. Nahla and final comments. So do you want me to respond now or after Dr. Nahla? Why not, why not respond now and then we'll go back uh, to Nahla, yes. So in, in uh, regard to your question, as I mentioned in uh, my speech that we are working on different levels, on the level of the grassroots, raising awareness, campaigns, supporting the leader, uh, women leadership in the communities and also providing services. But also we are working on the advocacy level and service provision and also working on policy level for advocacy and gender mainstreaming, changing all the discriminative laws that we have to achieve the gender equality. And uh, of course, for pandemic, uh, this is affected uh, negatively on women's situation and also affected on the work of women organization and on the development programs. So this is how we were able to uh, work on assessment to see the road causes and also what's the recommendation. So this is how now we are working, advocating on the recommendation, how to involve women in the uh, crisis cells that they established the committee, but there's lack of women participation. So how to have women out and how to have women perspective in, in those decisions. So this is what we are trying to do. And this is how we are supporting on this. Thank you. Thank you so much, Suzanne. And now I move on to uh, Dr. Nahla for your closing remarks in one or two minutes. Yes, very interesting, everybody. Thank you so much. And I thank you, SIP, for this opportunity as well. I apologize for the uh, president not existing. And uh, also, we, um, I uh, took notes from every one of you, and really, we, uh, everybody compliment the other. And I see I'm very positive in uh, when the COVID-19 is over, I think. Uh, we will have a, a new cycle of probably uh, a new uh, dynamics for gender, I think, empowerment. I'm very positive about it because uh, I realize that all this work with the United Nations and what uh, Dr. Marina said about ESCO and I like her comments on Lebanon very well. I didn't know about this uh, uh, details. Thank you so much, Dr. Marina and Dr. Bar also about this, all this. Uh, everybody added a little for my information as well. And, you know, uh, and I think this uh, the future is uh, for gender parity is coming soon. Uh, most importantly, that we have, uh, as I uh, said in the beginning, that we cannot only just say a presentation of women in parliament or whatever. We need to have more a global move. We need to have uh, gender norms to be changed. We can uh, institutions, stuff like that, not only the uh, number of women to increase in parliament, not enough, as we have seen throughout this, because the World Value Survey I had just read uh, yesterday, uh, has a new uh, uh, information about the egalitarian, uh, the uh, gender egalitarianism. It's very slow since 25 years till now. So that's predicament. That's something has to be done. It's not enough. Uh, the, you know, not enough to have. Uh, you know, we need. This means we need a game changer probably. But Dr. Kathleen has said probably is a very nice uh, gender dynamics new to include uh, men. And he for she is part of the process that started with the United Nations. So that's very promising, I would say. I will leave at this positive note. 
thank you so much again. Thank you, Dr. Nahla. And now, uh, Professor Val, for your closing remarks. Yes, thank you. Again, it's been uh, such a pleasure to be part of this scintillating um, discussion and conversation. Look, our region is um, it, it has just wonderful aspects and elements to it. The cultural heritage, the cuisine, the hospitality, the music. And um, I'd like our region to be known more for those things than for the fact that it has the highest military spending of you know, any um, other developing region and low female labor force participation and these wide gender gaps um, and uh, gender inequalities. Um, as a first step, um, and of course this is a complex issue and I think each of us has addressed this issue of gender inequalities from different angles. And in my case, it had to do with military spending and militarism. So as a first step, let us have less investment in militarism, more on social development, more on programs and policies for women and girls, including refugees, including um, migrant uh, uh, workers, more so solidarity across the region as well. So state priorities should change, especially in terms of state budgetary and fiscal priorities. And also the international community can help out by stopping the arms flow to the region. Thank you. Thank you so much again, Dr. Val. Dr. Kathleen? Thank you so much. Uh, just in closing, uh, again, it's been a great honor to share uh, this hour and a half with you all, uh, looking at the how we translate academic research into practice. Uh, I still remain uh, hopeful that gender equality uh, it becomes the norm, not just uh, outside the home, but also inside the home. And one way this has to happen is beginning at a very young age in terms of how we understand gender as a mechanism of how society organizes itself. It is not written in stone. It is malleable and there are opportunities that we need to engage in here. Thank you. Thank you again. And uh, finally, Dr. Mary Nuts. Thank you. And I want to close by saying that working on one element alone is not sufficient. Uh, so one piece of the puzzle is not going to solve it. It is the collective and comprehensive approach that brings in change. Suzanne had mentioned, for example, that Iraq is the first country in the region that had done a Women, Peace and Security National Action Plan and had also endorsed the second generation, yet violence against women had increased in Iraq. And this is because they're only working on one piece of the puzzle. So it's the collective approach, the legal reform going hand in hand with a solid NAP, with monitoring and evaluation framework, with an understanding of the cost of this uh, plan, investing in participation and making it survive and not only representation. We had very excellent examples during the uprising five women in Egypt being in the constitutional reform panel, like uh, amending the constitution and writing it, which never happened before. In Yemen, in the national dialogue, 30% were women, but it did not last long. So it's the sustainability of these and building on these great examples all together, not one at a time. Thank you. Thank you. And um, you know, we all remain hopeful that we are on the right track in terms of achieving gender uh, equality in the MENA region. I want to thank again the co-organizers, the U.S. Institute of Peace, and specifically Dr. Eli Abouaoun and Molly, uh, who was working behind the scenes to make this possible. And also, I want to thank the Ar American University in the Emirates, and specifically Dr. Nahla Yassin Hamdan for co-organizing this event. Thank you all. It was really an honor to be moderating this panel. Have a good day.